Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 130, The Conquest of Prussia, part 1. Now, last week we heard about Conrad of Mazovia's offer of the Kulmer land to the Teutonic Knights. This week we'll talk about what they did once they had accepted the offer. The first knights arrived in 1226, but it would take almost 60 years before the new Principality of Prussia was fully established. The old Prussians, despite initially being lightly armed and disunited, were no pushover. Rarely successful in open battle, they disappeared into the dense forest or swampy marches before they could be routed. Again and again they rose up, reclaiming their freedom, and again and again did the Teutonic Knights and the German and Polish Crusaders push them back into submission. Do not worry, this will not be an endless litany of battles and raids, but we will look at the relative military strength, the political structure they established, and as you would expect, the economic underpinnings of the effort. So, let's dive in. Before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com slash support. you find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to our most generous one-time contributors, Michael B., Carsten S. H., Margrethe H. and James B. Let's start with the obvious question. Where is Prussia? Or more precisely, Old Prussia, the land where the ancient Prutzi lived. Now, if you look at a modern map, it may be easiest if you start looking for the Kaliningrad Oblast, a Russian exclave wedged between Poland and Lithuania on the Baltic shore. This territory is, however, a bit smaller than the territory of the ancient Prussians. In 1225, when the story of the conquest begins, the Prussians are settling the land on the eastern shore of the Vistula, or Weichsel, river from Turun, Torn, to the Neman or Memel river in the east. Beyond the Neman lived the Kuronians, who some count amongst the Prussians and others amongst the Lithuanians or Latvians. This area is today part of Lithuania, with its regional capital at Klaipeda, or Memel in German. To the south, a system of forests, lakes and swamps separate the Prussians from the poles of Mazovia. And in the north, the Prussian lands stretch to the shoreline of the Baltic. This shoreline is dominated by two enormous lagoons. The Vistula Lagoon, or Frisches Haff in German, that stretches almost from Gdansk to Kaliningrad, i.e. from Danzig to Königsberg, and further east, the Kuronian Lagoon, or Kurisches Haff, that goes up to the city of Klaipeda, or Memel. This land was densely forested and still is interspersed with sheer innumerable lakes and rivers. At the time of the arrival of the Teutonic Knights, the total population of Prussia was estimated at 200 to 300,000. The best comparison may be Scotland, which is roughly twice the size and had a population of roughly half a million to a million people in this period. So, Prussia wasn't exactly densely populated, but it was by no means empty. The Prussians were Bolts, members of the same linguistic and cultural group as the Lithuanians and Latvians. These groups had once settled across a large chunk of northeastern Europe, but had been pushed towards the Baltic shore as the great migration of the 4th, 5th and 6th century sucked Slavic peoples into eastern Europe, all the way to the Elbe River. Of their religion, the chronicler Peter von Duisburg said, quote, Because they did not know God, they took erroneously all creation for gods, such as the sun, the moon and the stars, thunder, birds and even animals and so on, right down to the toads. End quote. Now, I leave it to you to decide how much you want to believe a Catholic priest in a military order in the 14th century when it comes to 12th century pagan religion. I personally doubt that they indeed worship toads, Though I do have a soft spot for them, and I find the idea of worshipping a toad god quite appealing. So I did a quick internet check on whether there are any cultures that worship toads, and all I found was a Chinese internet meme spoofing Zhang Zimin 
the general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party until 2002. So, well, I fear I digress. Now, leaving out the thing about the toads, it seems the old Prussians were pagans who believed in a set of gods not dissimilar to the pantheon of the Egyptians, the Greeks and the Romans, who all had their sun, moon and thunder gods. Prussian religion came with a complement of sacred springs and forests, but apparently no temples or similar structures. Some historians suggest that during a period of the very loose Viking overlordship of the Prussian lands, their belief became infused with elements of the Scandinavian pantheon, resulting in the dominance of a warrior god similar to the Lithuanian god of thunder called Perkunas. And, you know, please forgive me my pronunciation on pretty much anything I'm saying in this episode. Peter von Duisburg further claims there was a senior priest figure, a sort of mirror image of the Pope who exercised ultimate religious authority over Prussians, Lithuanians and Livonians, called the Kriever. There is, however, no corroborating evidence of his existence in other chronicles, which suggests it's another figment of the writer's imagination. What also did not exist was any sort of common secular authority, a king or duke of the Prussians. The Prussians were divided into roughly a dozen tribes, each of which were centered on a particular territory. Now, I'm not going to rattle down the names now, as you are likely to forget most of them as soon as I've called them out. But we will encounter them as we go through this story. Within these individual tribes, there was an aristocratic leadership class who led the tribe in war. They fought on horseback, carrying light armor, whilst the free men of the tribe made up poorly equipped infantry. They are shared in the ideal of the heroic fighter, who would not hesitate to instantly charge a vastly superior force on his own, berserker style. But the reality was that most Prussian military encounters ended with the losing side disappearing into the dense forest before they could be properly wiped out, and so they could regroup and fight another day. Economically, the free Prussians were mainly subsistence farmers. Aristocrats would not work but use slaves acquired in war to till their fields and serve as household help and concubines. Generally, slave-taking and trading was one of the ways the Prussian nobility boosted their income. The scale of this slave trade is probably exaggerated by the Christian chroniclers who were trying to paint the Prussians as backward barbarians. The Prussians did, however, have one important export product everyone acknowledged. Amber. Amber is a fossilized tree resin that has a deep yellow color and had been appreciated since antiquity. And though it can be found in multiple locations on the planet, by all accounts, Prussian amber is by far the most superior one. Pliny the Elder, always a reliable source, not, already mentioned a trade route from Prussia to Hungary by which the amber was brought down to the Mediterranean. The most valuable ambers were and are pieces that have inclusions, i.e. little insects or plant materials that have been trapped in the resin when it fossilized. The most famous and most mysterious and largest artwork made from amber is the Bernstein Zimmer. A whole room decorated with six tons of the most precious pieces of amber, which was initially created for King Frederick I of Prussia. His successor, the much less blingy King Frederick Wilhelm, gave this masterpiece by the court architect Andreas Schlüter to Tsar Peter the Great of Russia, who installed it in the Saskeo Selo Palace near St. Petersburg. There it remained until the Nazis got hold of it during the siege of Leningrad and had the whole thing packed into crates and sent back to Königsberg slash Kaliningrad, where they stored it in cellars underneath the castle. The castle was heavily bombed in 1944 and then burned down. After that, no trace of the original Bernstein Zimmer has ever been found. A replica was installed in the palace of Sakeo Selo in 2003 that had taken almost 40 years to create. But now back to the 13th century. The Prussians, disunited as they were, had been living in their homeland for centuries and exported their amber without bothering their neighbors in any unduly fashion, apart from their obstinate refusal to convert to Christianity. Their peaceful nature is even attested by the Teutonic chroniclers themselves. So, here's our friend Nikolaus von Jeroschin again. Quote, 
Their evil, sinful wickedness had made them so stubborn that no teaching or exhortation or blessing could move them from their error to take away their false belief. Although their minds were so sad, there was one praiseworthy thing about them. Because even if they themselves were inured to the faith and practiced the worship of all manner of idols, nonetheless, they lived at peace with the Christians who have settled alongside them during these years and allowed them to worship the living God without any interference. And this upset the evil enemy who always opposes true peace and is jealous of all good things. So he did not suffer the state of affairs for long. He threw the seeds of hate amongst them, precipitating a violent feud between them, during which the Christians suffered great anguish and distress. Some of them were killed and some driven off into slavery amongst the Prussians." Unquote. So just replace the evil enemy, the devil, with Conrad, the Duke of Mazovia, and we get closer to the truth. What had provoked the Prussians into a brutal border conflict with the Polish duchies of Mazovia to the south and Pomerelia to the east was a crusade the Pius Dukes had called in 1222 and 1223. And these crusades were spectacularly unsuccessful and only disrupted the peaceful missionary efforts that had been going on since 1206. The Prussians believed that the only way to prevent further attacks was to take the war into the land of their enemies. Here is Nicolas von Jeroschin again, quote, They inflicted great damage on the country. They looted and burned. They put all the men they came across to the sword and drove the women and children away into perpetual captivity. If there was a pregnant woman so heavy with child that she could not keep up with them, they became angry with her and killed her and her child. They roughly wrenched the children out of the arms of their mothers and impaled them here and there on snakes, where they struggled and screamed in pain and writhed in agony until they died. They devastated the Duke's land so completely that of all the fortresses large and small through which he imposed his control, only one on the Vistula, known as Ptok, was left under his command. End quote. Surely, Yeroshin is exaggerating here in order to justify the subsequent conquest of Prussia by the Teutonic Order. Remember that the Order was not just a military force, but also a monastic community that had to adhere to the teachings of the Bible, even though in a rather twisted way. That meant they had to prove that they were defending Christians from imminent danger, not just attacking otherwise harmless pagans who should be converted peacefully. Now, exaggeration or not, the fact that Prussians had taken many of his forward defences, including the fortifications at Kulm, and could raid into his core territory was a major problem for Conrad of Mazovia. Despite all his efforts, including the creation of his own chivalry order, the Prussians kept coming across the Vistula River and burned, amongst others, the great Cistercian Abbey of Oliva, twice. Conrad was quite simply desperate. Here is Nicolas von Jeroschin again. Quote, Before Poland was completely devastated by the Prussians, as I have read, and while there was still something left in the country, Duke Conrad was so hard-pressed by them and so afraid of them that whenever they sent emissaries demanding horses or fine clothing, he had to give in and did not dare refuse them anything. Therefore, when he had nothing more to offer them to satisfy their demands, his lack of resources compelled him to adopt this strategy. He invited his nobles and their wives and others to a social gathering, and when the guests were seated and eating and drinking cheerfully, he sent the Prussian emissaries what they had demanded. He secretly gave them his guests' clothes and horses and let them escape. End quote. When the first calls for help came in, the Teutonic Order had no capacity to send meaningful relief. They had their hands full with the Crusades of Frederick II, the one that was abandoned in 1226, and then the successful one in 1227-29. to All Hermann von Salzer was able to do for now was to send just seven knights with, say, 70 to 100 squires. These knights were likely raw recruits and older warriors too ill or infirm to journey to the Holy Land. Conrad of Mazovia gave them a border fortress on the Polish side of the Vistula River. Here is how again Nicolas von Jeroschin described the next few years. Quote, they called the castle Vogelsang, and here the brothers began the long war, establishing themselves without hesitation with just a few ill-equipped armed men 
against the heathen horde, which was innumerable. In their many tribulations, they did not sing the song of the nightingale, but songs like the song of grief the swan sings as it dies. They had left well-established, fruitful, calm and peaceful lands and come to a land of horrors and wilderness, which no one tended. It was completely joyless and full of hard fighting. And to put it bluntly, for God's sake, they had abandoned freedom, honor, family and all the joys of the world and given themselves up to a miserable existence. Their humble life were beset with hunger, hardship, poverty and abasement. End quote. It took three years until the crusade in the Holy Land was finally over. The treaty with the Sultan stipulated a ten-year truce between the Crusaders and the Saracens that freed the Teutonic Knights to relieve their fellow brothers in Vogelsang. Hermann von Salza dispatched one of his brothers, a man called Hermann Balk, in a much more sizable force to Prussia. Hermann Balk became the first master of the Teutonic Knights in Prussia and would lead the war here and in Livonia for the next twelve years. And under Hermann Balk, the Crusader strategy in Prussia changed fundamentally. Until he arrived, Crusaders had gathered their armies in spring and then driven straight into the interior of Prussia. They had fought the occasional open battle, which ended in an inconclusive victory as the Prussian forces disappeared into the forest before they could be routed. As autumn approached, they established multiple forts in the conquered territory and put a small garrison in each one of them to hold out until next spring, and then left. During the winter, the Prussians recaptured the forts that were too far away from any reinforcements, and then massacred the garrisons. The following year, the Crusaders had to conquer the same area again, and rebuild the same forts again, but the previous year's experience had dramatically reduced the already slim number of volunteers who were prepared to stay behind. So, the forts were taken even easier, and everything reverted back to zero. Bach's concept was to build the conquest slow and steady, rather than herring in and out of the enemy lands. So, instead of overstretching his forces, Balk built only one or two forts after each campaign, put in a sizable garrison of Teutonic knights who were willing to take the winter's cold and misery, and, crucially, had an escape route. And alongside the military effort ran a civilian effort. Balk invited settlers, mainly from central Germany, Thuringia, Saxony and Franconia, to settle in the shadow of these forts. The settlers, naturally, stayed over the winter as well and were prepared to defend their new homes alongside the Teutonic Knights. And these settlements grew rapidly and fortifications could be improved from just wooden fort to brick-built castles and finally towns and cities. Another sensible decision was not to go straight to the interior, but to build defensive positions first along the Vistula and then along the Baltic shore, thereby cutting the Prussians off from access to supplies, in particular from the supply of advanced Western weaponry, whilst at the same time keeping them from their most valuable export, amber. Campaigns had a very seasonal pattern. So during the summer, the Teutonic Knights forces were supported by contingents of German and Polish crusaders. The popes would call up Christian knights to fight in the north almost every year, and preachers mainly in northern Germany and Poland would offer volunteers to have their slate wiped clean if they took the cross. As before, these large forces would seek an open battle with one of the Prussian tribes, which they would usually win. And as before, the lightly armed Prussians would flee into the woods and swamps where the armoured riders struggled to follow. Now their main deed done, the crusaders would then help erect a fort before heading back home. In the winter, the Teutonic Knights garrison of the fort would not just sit around the campfire shivering. They would go out, and now that the rivers were frozen and the swamps hardened, they could seek out and harass the hidden Prussian villages and forts. It is during this period that the Teutonic Knights acquired the skills in winter warfare that they would become so famous for. Now, if you are like me, a Game of Thrones fan, and you have read that the Knight's Watch is based on the Templars, think again. The Templars fought mainly around the Mediterranean, not in the frozen lands of Eastern Europe. So if you're looking for an order of knights fighting in the snow and ice, the Teutonic Knights and the Livonian Sword Brothers 
that's your go-to place. That being said, this is where the similarity ends, since the Knights Watch sincerely lacked in spirituality. Hermann Balk arrived in 1230. During his first summer campaign in 1231, he established a fort at Thorn, at a place where the Drevens River flows into the Weichsel. This was the legendary castle in a tree. According to the Knights Chronicles, the original castle of Thorn was built inside an enormous oak tree. There are multiple depictions of battles of the Teutonic Knights against the Prussians where they're defending the oak tree with a full complement of walls and towers. But most historians believe this to be a legend, though it's unclear what the legend of the oak tree was to signify. There's also no archaeological evidence since the oak tree castle was finally abandoned as the site was too prone to flooding and the new and still existing castle of Thorn was built in a more traditional manner. The following year, Hermann Balk has enough forces to pursue two campaigns. 100 kilometers along the Vistula, where he founds the fort of Marienwerder. The other, following the Drevens about half the distance, where he put the next fort at Reden. With these three strategic positions, Balk had secured the Kulmerland, the territory the order had been offered by Duke Conrad of Mazovia, and had its ownership confirmed by the Emperor Frederick II. Control of the Kulmerland was what had been promised to the order and he had now achieved this objective. The question was, what next? Going further down the Vistula would be a move into territory that no Polish duke had conquered before. In the eyes of Christian noblemen of the 13th century, that meant it was no man's land. At which point the question arises, who should own this land? In hindsight, it feels entirely natural that the Teutonic Knights would get all of it, finders, keepers and such things. But hang on a minute. The Teutonic Knights did not conquer Prussia all by themselves. There were the Crusaders who provided the majority of the attack force in the summer. They hadn't come to fight for the Teutonic Knights, but for God and for whoever God chose to rule these lands. Some were Germans, many were Poles, vassals of Duke Conrad or one of his cousins, who had at least interest if not claims on Prussia. And Duke Conrad had called the Teutonic Knights to defend the border and may or may not have given them the Kulmerland in unencumbered ownership, but that does not automatically mean he would give up all rights to the rest of Prussia. The Teutonic Knights claimed that they had a contract with Duke Conrad. They gave them exactly that, full control of all of Prussia. But that again has been disputed by Polish historians, and even more importantly, has been renounced by the Polish kingdom once it had regained its stature in the 14th century. And finally, there was someone called Christian, the Bishop of Prussia. Now this cleric had been appointed as a missionary bishop to the Prussians by Pope Honorius in the 1220s. Bishop Christian surely believed he had a solid claim on at least parts of Prussia. In Livonia, where the situation was similar, the deal had been that the Bishop of Riga got two-thirds of the land and the Livonian Sword Brothers one-third, even though the Livonian Brothers did most of the heavy lifting. So by all accounts, a similar deal would have been the more natural outcome for any further negotiations between the parties involved. But the Teutonic Order had two aces up his sleeve. One was pure luck and the other was Hermann von Salza. The lucky part was that Bishop Christian was conveniently captured by the Prussians in 1233. Despite the bishop's entreaties, neither the Teutonic Order nor anyone else made an effort to get him released, which cut him out of the crucial negotiations until his release five years later, when, well, it was all over. Meanwhile, Conrad of Mazovia found himself in another squabble with his cousins that diverted his attention away from Prussia. So, with the two main contenders out of the picture, Hermann von Salza could dominate the diplomatic battlefield. In 1234, he persuaded Pope Gregory IX to confirm the order's rights in the Kulmer land and granted it ownership of all territory in Prussia still to be conquered. The Pope also put the order and its territory in Prussia under his direct control and protection. The following year, 1235, Hermann got Frederick II to do the same. He reissued the Golden Bull of Rimini that guaranteed the order the ownership of all conquered lands and making them imperial princes with all the rights and protection that entailed. 
Both Pope and Emperor have now confirmed their ownership of the lands that the Crusades were to conquer. Nothing the bishop and the duke could do about it anymore. And best of all, the order now had two bosses, the Pope and the Emperor, which meant they had no boss. Now weirdly, once all the legal stuff was out of the way, that's when the conquest continued with renewed energy. In 1236, Hermann Balk and his Teutonic Knights, supported by the Markgraf of Meissen and his army of crusaders, pushed further along the Vistula, beyond Marienwerder. And that campaign was even more successful than the previous two. They forced the Pomeranian Prussians to provide them with large riverboats that brought them down to the mouth of the Vistula, where they founded Elbing. From there, they moved further inland and established Christburg. That cut the next tribe the Pogesanians, off from the Amber on the coast, at which point they, too, submitted to the order. Now this period was followed by a period of lull, when the overall situation was so calm, Hermann Balk could send some of his forces north to Riga to support the Livonian sword brothers who had just been integrated into the Teutonic order. And this period of calm was also when the second leg of Hermann Bach's strategy gained traction. As they had shown in Transylvania, the Teutonic Knights were not only a strong military force, they were also great at economic development. The German settlers who had started trickling into Prussia right from the beginning were becoming a wave of immigration, as the Teutonic Order's hold on the territory strengthened. And these settlers not only set up villages as they had done in the lands east of the Elbe since the 12th century, the order also encouraged the establishment of towns and cities. The ink on the capitulation of the Prussian warriors at Kulm wasn't yet dry in 1233 when Hermann Balk issued the Kulmer Handfeste, granting city rights to Kulm and Torn based on Magdeburg law. The conditions for the new citizens were in some respects very generous, namely on taxes, tolls, fines, and the regular devaluations medieval rulers implemented as a way of funding themselves. On the flip side, though, the order's control over the city's institutions was much tighter than, for example, in the other Hansa cities founded around this time, like, for instance, Danzig. What amazes me is how quickly these settlements become wealthy in the 13th century. In 1231, Kolm was allegedly a broken fort, but by 1242, Kulm, Rieden and Torn had brick walls. Trade was flourishing, flourishing to a degree that it caused concern for Duke Swantopolk of Pomerelia, whose capital and main trading centre was Gdansk, slash Danzig, and he was feeling the heat from the competition. Meanwhile, the conquest of the coastal areas continued. In 1239, the Crusaders established Balga on the Vistula Lagoon as a fortress to suppress the Varmia, another one of the 11 Prussian tribes. Things moved forward as planned, slow and steady, or should have done so had it not been for the arrival of a new kid on the block, the Mongols. Now The Mongols had their eyes on Hungary, having conquered most of the former empire of the Rus. The direct route into Hungary was through the Carpathian mountain passes that could be defended by even a relatively small force. Therefore, the Mongol Khan sent two armies, one directly to Hungary and one to go around the Pannonian Basin, aiming to get to Hungary via Poland, Saxony and Bohemia. And this invasion was extremely successful. The Mongol army pushed rapidly into Poland and found little resistance on the mountain passes into Hungary. In April 1241, at two separate battles, they wiped out the Polish forces of Duke Henry the Pious of Silesia at the Battle of Lignitz and the forces of King Bela of Hungary at the Battle of Mohi. For some still not completely understood reasons, the Mongols did not exploit their victory beyond some light plundering and massacring. They withdrew as quickly as they had come. The net result was that Europe remained in the grip of fear of another Mongol invasion for decades, and the Polish dukes blamed each other for the disaster, which made them even weaker and even more disunited than they had been before. And now, at exactly the same time, the Teutonic Knights in Livonia got into conflict with the Republic of Novgorod, a story we will look at in more detail in two weeks. 
What is important here is that this conflict led to the famous Battle on the Ice, in which Alexander Nevsky, leading the forces of the Republic, defeated an army of the Teutonic Knights. News of a defeat of the seemingly invincible Teutonic Knights spread like wildfire across Prussia. The Prussians also sensed that Duke Conrad of Mazovia and the other Polish dukes were too weak to come to the aid of the order. What swung them into action was that Duke Swantopolk of Pomerelia had had enough of his cousins, the Teutonic Knights, and the competitions from the citizens of Thorn, Kuln and Elbing, and so he allied with the Prussians. What turned the situation from a challenging to an existential crisis for the Teutonic Knights in Prussia was that Swantopolk, or maybe others, provided the Prussians with modern Western military equipment, armor, swords and the like. Suddenly, the knight's superiority even in open battle wasn't assured. In 1244, the knight suffered a defeat at Rieden and in 1249 at Krücken. Within a short period, the order was reduced to just the three brick-built castles and cities, Kulm, Thorn and Rieden. Then the war ground down to a stalemate. The Teutonic Knights were unable to hold the open countryside and even where they had built wooden forts, they were often overrun. On the other hand, the Prussians and Swantopolk were unable to take the three strong castles. So this could have easily been the end of the story, had it not been for papal support. We are now in the year 1249. Hermann von Salza is long dead and the struggle between the emperor and the pope had moved into its final stages. Either side is convinced that only a complete destruction of the other could bring a resolution. In this last decade, the Teutonic Order outside Prussia had cycled through a number of Grand Masters, was split internally and had been yo-yoing between the papal and the imperial side. But the order was still very rich and had an immense moral authority, making it a coveted ally in this struggle. Hence, the new Grand Master was able to convince Pope Innocent IV to call a crusade against Svantopolk and the Prussians. So now the Teutonic Knights were able to clear the Kulma land and regain Marienwerder, whilst the other Polish dukes threatened to take Gdansk and dislodge Svantopolk from the mouth of the Vistula. Svantopolk was now ready to negotiate, which forced the Prussians to the table as well. The Pope had sent a legate to balance the various interests of the Church, the Polish Dukes, the Order, and indeed the Prussians. The complex negotiations ended with the Treaty of Christburg in 1249. The Teutonic Knights were confirmed in their control of the Prussian lands they had conquered previously. But they had to accept the creation of three independent bishoprics in their territory, they had to tolerate a crusade by the King of Norway against the Samland a Prussian territory north of their recent acquisitions, they had to agree to give the citizens of Lübeck and the Polish princes shares in any further conquest, depending on their level of participation. And finally, they were obliged to grant the converted Prussians full citizens' rights equal to those of the Christian settlers, including the right for their aristocrats to become knights. These were tough conditions that, if permanent, would have prevented the Teutonic Knights from creating the theocratic state Prussia would eventually become. The Peace of Christburg puts an end to the First Prussian Revolt. As you can gather from the name First Prussian Revolt, there may be another one. In fact, there will be two more. But time is up. As usual, I've spent far too much time digressing and describing long-lost civilizations. Next week, I will try to be crisper and I will fail again. But I should get through the remaining 40 years of the conquest of Prussia, and I hope you will join us for that again. And if you want to read ahead, there are some book recommendations in the show notes and a link to the very excellent translation of Nicholas of Yeroshin's Chronicle by Mary Fisher, well worth a read. Now before I go, let me thank all of you who are supporting the show, in particular the patrons who have kindly signed up on patreon.com slash historyofthegermans. It is thanks to you that this show does not have to start with me endorsing mattresses or meal kits. If Patreon isn't for you, another way to help the show is sharing the podcast directly or boosting its recognition on social media. If you share, comment or retweet a post from the history of the Germans, it's more likely to be seen by others, hence bring in more listeners. 
My most active places are what used to be Twitter, now X, at Germans History, and my Facebook page, History of the Germans Podcast. As always, all the links are in the show notes. <laughs>